good, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, December's Wellbeing Webinar. Um, today, Tom will be talking about the Great Resignation. Um, what is it? Why is it happening? Um, and more importantly, what, you know, what, what can we do about it in the future? Um, so if you've not come across Tom before, if you've not been to a webinar, um, Tom is one of the directors and trainers here at Change Your Minds Kent. Um, we're a community interest company. Um, he's a wellbeing coach and a mental health first aid trainer and has done so for seven years. He's currently doing a master's in applied positive psychology um, at the University of East London um, and using that to develop um, courses that we offer um, in-house or also open via Eventbrite as well. And he's worked in the mental health sector for over 20 years. Um, so just to let you know that the session this morning, uh, we are recording it. Um, if you registered via Eventbrite, I'll automatically have your email address. So it will be sent out to you. Um, early next week, along with any of the resources, um, the slides that Tom uses, uh, we'll get those sent out to you automatically. If you didn't register and you just jumped on because you saw the passcode on LinkedIn or on Facebook, um, if you want to add your email address into the chat, um, I can get that sent out to you. And I've already I've put our management email in there. So if you, if you want to send it privately to me, I can add you to our list to get those resources sent out to you. And like I said, it'll probably be Monday, Tuesday next week that we'll get that to you. OK, Tom, are you kind of ready to go? Yeah, ready as I'll ever be, Amy. Lovely. Thank you very much. OK, so good morning, um, everyone. Thank you for uh, making the time to uh, come along and listen. I really hope that, um, you know, maybe there's a, there's a few ideas in our um, kind of short webinar uh, this morning which might resonate with you, might be kind of helpful um, for you. Um, so I've got some slides here. This slide deck, I think, will be kind of emailed out. So if there's anything in there you like, oh, that's a link there, or there's a stat or something, and that might be interesting for work for whatever reason, then don't worry, that will be um, in your email boxes um, next week. So I just want to give you just a, a little bit of like, who are we? You know, what, why are we doing this webinar? What you know, what's going on? Um, just a little bit about um, changing minds. Um, so I just want to let you know that we are a non-profit um, organisation that we do. On one hand, we work with businesses and we do kind of uh, uh, training um, uh, with businesses, but we also work in the community um, as well. Um, and so these 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 two kind of parts kind of go hand in hand. So we do projects in the community around mental uh, and physical um, kind of uh, well-being. Um, and so the two kind of support each other. Um, so just kind of give you a bit of an idea. For example, you know, this is us last month up in London. We were doing some kind of training. Uh, with a, uh, an organisation up there in central London. But then we'll also be doing stuff like this. Um, you see here, we've got a wellbeing pod and this is um, some activities where we've had a fund where we're kind of doing like local stuff with schools around you know, mental and physical uh, wellbeing. So they're the kind of things that we're kind of getting involved with, um, 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 with, with businesses and, and in the community. Um, okay, so let's have a little... Um, um, Kind of move on to this this idea of the great resignation i don't know if it's this this is a uh, a bit of a new cultural phenomenon um, um you might have kind of seen um, um some bits and pieces in the press uh, about it what are people talking about well uh, um because it's kind of relatively new it's been quite hard to try and get your kind of um information about exactly what's uh, going on but um i, I found this um um, nice graph um, in the press, which kind of shows, uh, it's starting to show the issue that we're kind of talking about. So um, apologies for the low resolution, um, but because it, it was a bit of a, just a copy paste job um, straight into this presentation. But um, what you'll see is that over the years, um, you know, this is kind of voluntary quit, quit rates have kind of uh, varied between kind of one and two and a half percent. But what you'll sort of see during the pandemic, there was a, a sharp decline in people quitting, I think maybe just because of this kind of feeling of the, the unknown and just kind of sticking with their kind of work situation. But off the back of that, late, later in, in 2020 into 2021, suddenly um, 
people are quitting like never before. And so this phenomenon has been called the great resignation. Um, who is it affecting? Um, well, it, multiple industries, really. And, and you know, maybe you, you guys might have comments. Feel free to throw something in the chat if, uh, if this is something that's uh, affecting you. But we've heard of like, you know, certainly in the UK, and I'm, I'm assuming everyone here is in the UK, but maybe you're not, I don't know. Uh, but certainly here in the UK, there's been issues around, you know, we've seen stories about lorry drivers, not enough lorry drivers. Um, I also work um, in like care, um, like health and social care. There's a big issue around like, you know, not having enough carers and support workers and what have you. So if there's already been like issues in an industry um, with recruitment and retention, this situation is making it harder than, than before. Um, this, I've seen uh, issues around hospitality, trying to find people, especially working on social hours, even barbers. I went to get my hair cut the other day and um, the barber shop had closed. And what was really interesting, I was speaking to another barber. He said um, that um, everyone had quit and there was, there was more barber shops than barbers. Um, and what was interesting was that there had been some sort of, just a bit of a, the, uh, a, a tipping point uh, where the, there were barbers that could work in the shop, but because they couldn't keep it open all the time, seven days a week, and they were having to close on certain days, they were starting to lose custom. People were just assuming that they were shut because they couldn't keep it open. So there's something there about sort of thinking about, the, you know, like a tipping point in businesses. And I have spoken with a number, of, say, of care and support, like larger kind of organisations, some of their kind of chief executives and stuff like that, and they really do think that this has the potential of being like an existential threat to the business. If people start quitting, then the, that that work needs to be done by a smaller amount of people, and those small that smaller group of people suddenly feel even more stressed, more burnt out, more likely to leave, and so you end up with this kind of um, you know hitting a tipping point. Unless you've got you know like a, a fallback position where you can kind of regroup uh, and, and focus your your energies as a business you can sort of find that everyone's stressed and everyone's leaving. And that's obviously not great. Um, so this is this is what we're talking about, the great resignation. Um, the quit rate is going up. People are doing, uh, leaving um, their, their places of work like never before. And I think there's lots of reasons for that. And what we're sort of interested, I was going to do a, um, you know, maybe like a breakout room. But I'll tell you what, maybe instead, um, maybe we can use the chat function um in uh, zoom so if you look down at the bottom there um you might see the the chat or oh, someone's already yeah um so someone's already put something in there so what do you think are the main reasons that people are quitting we, we'll cover a few after this but i want to i want to kind of get a sense of you know maybe in your place of work or your business what what do you think the issues are why are people leaving um so um feel free to throw um, a thought in the chat function. I'll read it out. Um, um, Zoe's saying support staff in schools are becoming ever more difficult to hold on to. Um, they can take their amazing skills elsewhere for better pay. So pay, okay. So pay, pay is an is an issue. Um, it's not, but I don't know what you think. Is is that the only issue? As long as you pay good money, then people will stay. Um, is that what we're saying? Um, um, yes. Okay. So uh, Amy said, um, use furlough time to upskill themselves. So yeah. So maybe the, the, there's something of that going on. Um, I, I also think the kind of furlough time, uh, and also um, um, the the stress. I think um, of all the changes that have happened in workplaces have led to people. Um, reworking out what it is that they want um, out of work and out of life uh, and those that were just kind of going along in their usual kind of job suddenly have woken up um, I've heard some commentators call it the great awakening people suddenly going oh why am I working here again um, I want to do something different I'm going to start a business um, and, and so people have got ideas and they're sort of re kind of configuring like what it is that they want um, great so Gavin um, Gavin saying, um, choosing an employer that supports WFH. Um, Gavin, what's WFH? Type that in. I, did, I, I could probably guess, but I don't want to get it wrong. Um, 
work from home. Okay. Um, so yeah, there's this issue, issue around hybrid working. So we might talk about that in a minute. Um, acceptance and culture. That's also really interesting. We might talk about that a little bit. Um, Natalie, leaving and going elsewhere where they are paying more for the same job or having other benefits to working for them, pensions, retention schemes, more flexibility, working from home, mental health, well-being, help in other ways. That's great, um, Natalie. Thank you very much. We hit some key points there. Um, work from home. Karen Smith, we're struggling to keep up with salaries in such a competitive market without causing disparity with our existing workforce. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, is anyone else struggling with the sound? Um, is anyone else struggling with the sound? Can everyone hear me all right? Um, those of you who got the cameras on, thumbs up. Can you hear me, Laura? Indigit? No, Indigit's gone. Yep, yeah. can hear you, yeah. Yeah, good, all right. Um, um, Karen, if you have kind of issues, you can always talk, speak to us afterwards. This is This session is being recorded, so you can always um, have a little kind of listening to the kind of re recorded session. We'll probably put it on YouTube uh, for a little while afterwards. Okay. Um, so, yeah, uh, uh, thank you very much um, to Natalie. Um, um, there's some, some good ideas there. Uh, Zoe, pay and more pressure to take on bigger responsibility with no monetary benefits. COVID definitely impacted school support staff in terms of the expectations and uh, risks to them. Yeah, so there's a, there's a lot of kind of changes um, and expectations on people. Uh, work has changed because society's changed. Um, okay, I've, I've picked out three here I'd like to kind of share with you um, um, when it comes to kind of, you know, what's going on. Um, first of all, uh, what does the research say? Um, people are interested in values. Um, what do I mean by that? Um, so Monster... Um, they did some uh, research um, a couple of months ago now. 57% uh, of candidates want to know about a company's values before applying for a specific role. Okay, 29% um, of candidates won't even uh, uh, want to know about it before they even consider them as an employer. Um, so there's something about uh, values, you know, what it is that you're doing um, as a business. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Um, what about this bit of research? Um, recent research, what people ranked as most important was care. Um, um, you know, that it's obvious that a company cares and supports their employees. Um, so uh, a recent research showed that 21.7% rank care as the most important aspect, um, slightly ahead of economic factors, pay and benefits, um, so 20% of people say that, you know, paying benefits, job security. Now, that's really important. But what's even more important is this sense that the, the business that they're working for is actually interested in them uh, and looks after them. A close third was that um, the, 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 the work is stimulating. It's an even in an innovative work environment. Um, so I think that's really striking research. Uh, for the first time, people value more about how a company cares than what they actually pay. Now, that's to say that you can just pay, you know, uncompetitive rates and people are going to say, of course, not. but there's something else going on. It's not just pay. It's also this kind of idea of a, the culture, um, uh, the kind of feeling that, that people get when they work with you um, or in, in your place of work. What else does the research say? Um, and this, was, this is mentioned, which is really interesting, this idea of hybrid working. Um, study by Harvard Nash Group found eight in 10 digital leaders report post-pandemic new life priorities among staff are making retention even more difficult. Um, and so uh, why is that? 38% um, of companies have redesigned their working structure to allow for, for hybrid working. Um, so, so still, like you know, the, the, the vast majority haven't. Um, so that's something worth thinking about. Um, and what about this? 40% of people will consider walking out on their job altogether if working back in the office full time is made mandatory. That was um, reported in the Metro newspaper um, a couple of weeks ago. There are there are a number of different stats. I think that I think it's safe to say that there's um, there's lots of change going on. I've seen this number lower and higher. This kind of feeling like, oh, if the boss makes me go in full time, I have to go in and commute again. I'll, um, so there's something about that, that people have got, a, a, you know, this kind of taste of 
hybrid working, you know, to what degree can that be kind of redesigned into to work? It's something worth thinking about. It might not be an easy thing to do, depends on, you know, the workplace and what it is that you do, uh, but it's something to think about because um, that, that's what we're kind of competing uh, against when we sort of think about who it is that we, the, we we're employing, how we keep uh, people and how we recruit new people. Okay, so um, what can we do about it? I suppose this, these are just some kind of thoughts um, um, that may be, you know, worth kind of considering. Again, don't worry, this slide will be kind of sent out to you. Um, so if there's a little idea in here, then, you know, um, don't worry about needing to jot it down necessarily. Um, so, so one, um, creating a, a people strategy, sometimes called a people strategy or a well-being plan. You might think, oh, where do I start with that? Well, luckily, next slide, you know, will kind of um, give you the bare bones of the kind of things that you might want to be considering. Um, values. I mean, it's really interesting, I mean, especially with younger people. Younger people are interested in working with uh, businesses and organizations that um, to at least some extent kind of reflect their own kind of values and how, how it is they kind of see uh, the world. So um, have a think about that. You know, why are you doing what you're doing in, in work? Why would anybody want to come along and help you with that? Uh, and how do you communicate that? How do you communicate that digitally? How do you communicate that in your recruitment process? Um, as something worth thinking about, because when you're when you're increasingly when we're kind of interviewing people, they're also interviewing us. Um, and I think that's that's something kind of uh, worth bearing in mind. It didn't used to be that in the case of the, the interview as a one way process, but now it's a two way process. So that's something worth thinking about. Um, you know, think about look at your website. Um, if someone's going to apply for a job to work with you, um, what does your website look like? Does it say that you care? Um, uh, what's going on? Uh, why would someone choose your place of work over anyone else? So have a have a look at your website. If your website looks like the same as everyone else's, and maybe you're missing, maybe you're missing a, a an opportunity there. Um, um, three, um, consider uh, redesign. Um, you know this kind of work life balance. Again, I know that's not easy. Um, depends, you know, some workplaces, they actually have to be fixed and people have to be in a certain place at a certain time. Nothing you can do about that. But have a little think, um, you know, certainly maybe with managers, um, allowing them more freedom. Do they really need to be in a certain place at a certain time? Um, can you encourage um, other things? So it's something that, that we do, which I love, which uh, we haven't done for a little while because it's cold. But, what, but walking meetings, getting out into nature, like if you can have a like a board meeting or a senior management meeting, do it outside, especially in the spring. That'll be nice. Um, new environment, new thoughts. Um, you know, so something that we we do. Um, I've had people uh, come to work with me previously. They worked at the council, and this was like a revelation. What we can go outside and we can walk around and we can talk and we can just go and get a cup. Yeah, we can because you know we're we're in charge of our own work environment and. Uh, so that's something to kind of bear in mind. So I love that kind of idea of a kind of, you know, a walking meeting. It changes and challenges people um, and, you know, maybe come up with new ideas because of that. I certainly have. Uh, and finally, one I'll talk about, this is a really kind of new idea, job embeddedness theory. Um, so the theory is this. Um, um, the more that people feel embedded in their place of work, the, the less likely they are to leave. Um, so how do you embed people? Um, well, you want to make them feel like they're connected. Um, you know, if their best friend works at your place of work, they're more likely to stay, right? So um, it's, we've got to think about how do we create connections so that if someone wants to leave, okay, they're having to sacrifice more. Um, the, more of a, the more that people hang around in a place of work and kind of build up relationships, the more likely they are to stay. So how do we foster good, like quality, healthy relationships at work. Um, like it happens naturally, of course, but can we make that happen like more often? So that's something to think about. Um, so we have, um, you know, I know it's it's kind of corny, um, but doing kind of, you know, um, team building stuff, you know, going to hide a team. What did they do the other day? Um, they did um, the, like an escape room. Um, something like that. I think there's some ideas out there. It depends on your maybe your, your staff, you know, 
don't want to do an escape room. Um, but it's that type of idea, just, you know, it, 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 you know, certainly from a management perspective, just sort of thinking about, you know, how do we foster um, these kind of connections? What kind of um, perks do you get um, in your place of work? So uh, we, I think everyone's used to this idea of like a USP, you know, a unique selling point. Each business has a USP. But do you have a USP when it comes to your staff? Um, so in, in our place of work, obviously we do a lot of well-being training and stuff like that. So let's do some well-being training. Let's invest in people. Let's give them ideas. Let's make them feel valued. That's something that we can do. So um, we have training programs that really kind of make people feel like they're invested in it and that that we we care for them, especially around like mental well-being and stuff like that. So we have a lot of people kind of go through that kind of training, um, and I think that's helpful. Um, so a few ideas there. You know what we can do about it. Um, maybe that might give you an idea or two of some things maybe you could do. Um, I, I said about a, like a workplace well-being plan. What goes into that? Um, well, um, here's an interesting slide. I just wanted to talk you through this. There might be some interesting um, ideas in this. So I think if you're going to do any sort of kind of well-being, it's really important that you take some sort of benchmark at the beginning, like you take some sort of measure, like what is people's well-being? And then you do something and then you, you, you check the well-being again. Did that have any impact? And if it did, then maybe you need to try some other intervention. But I think it's really important that certainly as a business, if you're going to invest a little bit of money in some sort of intervention, that you want to know it's actually had the impact that you want. So um, a, a couple of ways that maybe that you can measure that um, um, indirectly, maybe through actual turnover. I mean, do you know what your turnover is? Um, grievances, um, time off on sick. Um, 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 that there are a number of kind of figures that maybe from an organizational level you can kind of pick up and go, right, that's that's where we're at currently. What I'd like to do is reduce grievances. I'd like to reduce turnover. Um, uh, other more direct measures, um, I really love uh, PERMA as a measure like of general well-being. Um, so we have a workshop on that if you want to know a little bit more about PERMA. But, you know, it's a survey you can do and it, you know, kind of gives you a score. You can actually benchmark that. Um, hundreds of thousands of people have done PERMA surveys and you get like a, a bit of a report really about your kind of well-being. That's that's from the field of positive psychology, which I'm studying at university. Another one which might be interesting is this WEMWEBS, um, the Warwick and Edinburgh Mental Wellbeing Scale. That's quite good because they have a seven question version which has been validated. So seven questions, nice and quick. Um, some other ones which might be of interest to you, um, turnover intention scale. That's a six question um, um, survey. Um, job satisfaction scale. Um, that's really interesting because they've got some subscales in there to do with like how well do you get on with your, your like relationships with your um, colleagues? How well do you get on with your boss? What do you think about your pay? What do you think about your work? Uh, there's, there's an, an, and actually be really interesting. You know, do they all score high? Was there a few areas of improvement there? So maybe a job satisfaction scale. Um, I mentioned job embeddedness. Again, there's a scale for that. You can just kind of put out there to staff. Um, that seems to have, the research shows that, that job embeddedness is actually more closely related to turnover intention. So the more embedded people are, the less likely they are to leave. So that's kind of quite interesting. So if you don't want to do a turnover intention, like basically, are you planning to leave in the next six months type of question with your employees? Maybe ask a job embeddedness type question. How well are you connected? How well do you get on with people? How much do you like your work? That that would be a, a, a good measure of like what the next 12 months might look like. Um, uh, another great scale, psychological capital. I love this idea. So we all, as businesses, we've got a bank account. If your mental well-being of your staff had a bank account, what would it be? Would you be bankrupt? Like, would you have something in the bank? That's a good question. So psychological capital is not just a model. It's not just something that maybe you can train. It's something you can actually measure as well. So it's a measurement tool. If any of these are interest, uh, of interest to you, um, I do have them uh, to hand. Um, I'm quite happy for you to have them. Um, the psychological capital is a bit of a different one because you do actually have to pay for that. And the person who come up with it, um, you do have to pay a little bit of money. So I can't give you that one. That's copyrighted. But the other ones are ones that you might be able to 
um, find on the internet um, and have a little look at. Maybe that might be able to be part of your plan for measuring, implementation, then measure again, see what's going on. Um, what I will say is when you, if you ask staff questions about how, you know, what their well-being is and, you know, there is this issue around honesty. Um, if you're asking what their name is and then you're asking their well-being, um, don't expect that their honesty is going to be 100%. So you've got this kind of balance between honesty and actionable data. You know, the more, the more specific they are, the less honest they're going to be, maybe. Um, so there needs to be anonymity in the, you know, so um, in, the, in, the, in the research that I'm doing, um, so I'm using some of these scales and doing some research for my masters. I'm not asking a name because as soon as you ask people's name, people can clam up a little bit. They give a response that they think you want to hear uh, and then you don't get the truth and then the, 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 the data is no good for anyone. So that's really important that you ask the right questions, that there's anonymity in uh, what it is that you're asking. Um, what else can you put into your workplace wellbeing plan? Uh, training, we'll talk about training in a bit, but I think training is really important to open up new ideas for people, uh, little workshops, um, little um, presentations on Zoom to staff, um, you know, maybe little things you can do in, in, in staff meetings. Um, here's an idea, third one down, structured supervision. If you don't do it already, you know, having something that a, a set period of time uh, where you're kind of meeting with people, um, to see how things are going, even maybe including a staff wellbeing plan. How about that as an idea? Um, you know, could that be, it doesn't have to be anything um, over the top, but it's just, it's, you know, can you structure into the, 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 the process a conversation about like, how are you doing? Is there anything that, 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 that could be done differently? Do you have any ideas? Um, I think it's worth being honest uh, about asking those questions and sort of hoping that you give people the opportunity to sort of um, come up with some ideas. Um, I'm not suggesting that workplaces need to take responsibility for everyone's mental well-being. Like, you can't do that. But if you can do little bits, um, there is benefit uh, to how you're perceived as a place of work. Um, fourth one down, ask people, you know, if we had a well-being plan, what would you have in it? Um, and people always say, oh, yeah, pay us more money. And then you say, yeah, and what else? Um, you know what I mean? Um, I think it's important to say, you know, pay is, is an important thing, but it's not the only thing. Like pay needs to be competitive, but it being competitive on its own is not going to keep people and it's not going to attract people into a place of work. Um, you need some of these other things uh, going on as well. So um, ask people, uh, make them feel included. Um, Strategise, have an annual plan, have events. You know, have like plan when you're going to do the training when are you going to do the the, the measurements uh, by way of events um, something that we have been doing with some um, NHS partners recently you might have seen that well-being pod thing um, we've been plonking outside places of work uh, a couple of well-being coaches um, the staff will be coming out in dribs and drabs we'll be doing um, blood pressure asking people about their stress levels um, you know maybe a smoothie um, and then also doing some kind of signposting with them. You know, so someone comes along and says, oh, you know, my husband's terribly depressed. What do I do about it? And some of the wellbeing coaches can kind of signpost into other organizations and stuff like that. That's been really kind of a very informal sort of support, but an event like that. And so kind of go around workplaces. Uh, so that's something we've been doing recently that people have found helpful. Um, so that could be a little event or plan that. So if you do have a plan, it's really important. This is the fifth, hang on, one, two, three, four, five, the sixth one down. Communicate what you're doing. Um, so uh, let people know what you're doing. So there is a bit of a, a, a like a psychological social theory uh, around this idea of perceived support. Um, so when you tell people that you're supporting people um, in, the, in the workplace, sometimes people feel supported, even though you haven't actually done anything. Um, because they perceive that the support is there. Just perceiving that, there's, that there is things in place to help people sometimes is enough. It's a little bit like the net. Um, you know, if you're walking on a tightrope and there's a net underneath, you have increased confidence because you know, if I needed the net, it's there, but I don't need it. So it actually gives people a sense of confidence. Um, so communicate your plan to people. That's really important. Um, I've got a link here. I always uh, like to kind of throw this out. Um, the, the Kent and Medway Healthy Workplaces, if you're locally, this is a free scheme, it's government funded, 
where you can actually get like a bronze, um, silver, gold kind of certificate for your place of work when it comes to kind of well-being. Um, it's a great idea. Um, and it's a way of kind of communicating that you're thinking about uh, well-being at work, not just mental well-being, but physical well-being. So the, the more pledges a business makes, um, you know, they kind of get this kind of external validation um, and certification, which, you know, you've got your website, you do your social medias and stuff. Um, and so that's a great way of communicating that as a business, you know, you're a good place to work, you know. Um, so uh, that's something to bear in mind. I've just stuck this seventh one. What about an online short well-being talk? Um, you know, that's something that uh, we do um, for for businesses, even if it's just, you know, half an hour, 45 minutes, you know, seven things that mentally strong people do during a pandemic. You know, are you doing these seven things? Be, re be really fascinating uh, when you find out that a lot of people aren't doing these things. Um, so, so even just like just little things like that, I think sometimes you're communicating to your place of work and, and business that actually you do care um, and that you're, you're trying to do something. Um, and so I think that's that, that's seven things to do in the workplace. Um, how are we doing for time? Not doing too bad. Okay. Um, we're going to just throw, oh, hang on. I've gone too far. Amy, um, you might be able to throw this uh, link into the chat. Um, this is um, a link to workplace well-being quiz. Um, throw your details in there. Um, you take a little kind of test, kind of ask you a bunch of questions, um, and you get like a a, um, a bit of report. You know how things are kind of going organisationally, mentally, physically, emotionally, and, and nutritional well-being. So we're thinking about um, uh, like more kind of physical health. Um, our colleague Colin will normally just kind of touch base with you afterwards, see if you want to chat about any of these things, if there's anything we can do um, to help. But that, that's a nice little kind of um, way of kind of benchmarking, just asking some questions. You might even get some ideas out of some of the questions that are being asked. Um, you know, do you do this? You think, mm, no, I don't, but I could do. Um, so have a little look at that. Um, um, I promise you Colin won't hound you. It, it would just probably just send you a short email saying, you know, if you'd like to catch up. Is there anything we can do to help with any of these things? But it's an interesting sort of um, exercise to go through. Um, I think it only takes, what, five minutes, Amy? Maybe not even that. Yeah, five minutes. Um, and then you can kind of get a bit of a, a score. So the, the, the link there is in the chat function. Um, I suppose you can always put that in the email as well, um, Amy, uh, when you kind of send that around next week. Yeah, so that might be helpful. Um, so just some, some extra kind of ideas around, you know, supporting organizations to build mentally healthy cultures. So I think this is, this is for me, I sort of think that the one thing that we can do, you know, we can't always increase people's wages exponentially, but I think the, the other kind of driver in actually making like um, the, the most of the situation of what we have as an organization for driving recruitment and retention is making sure that we've got a, healthy workplace culture and that that's actually communicated internally and externally. Uh, what kind of things? Um, well, we don't have time to kind of read all of these, but the ones that I've, I've made bold, there's about seven there, I sort of feel like they're things that you can actually improve through training. Um, so um, what kind of training? Um, let me just um, show you. This is some training. We've done a lot of this training over the years. I know um, Amy mentioned mental health first aid. Um, so I don't really know. Increasingly, a lot of people have heard of it, but not everyone's heard of it. So for those of you who haven't heard of it, um, mental health first aid, it's not physical first aid. This is mental health first aid. What does it cover? Have a look at the bottom, you know, um, anxiety, depression, psychosis, suicide, eating disorder, self-harm, um, how to provide initial support, uh, signposting skills. Um, it comes in um, a two day, one day and a half day version. Um, so I have known some organizations, maybe they choose some champions um, in their place of work and maybe they put them on the two day. Maybe some of the managers do the one day. Maybe some of the other staff do half day. It depends how big your organization is and what it is you would like to do. Um, I would say that um, with this training, there's a lot of this training have you know been going on in the last five, 10 years. I've experienced good training and bad training when it comes to mental health first aid. Um, I like to think that we do good training. You know, we obviously we, we do um, feedback and you know, our feedback has always been a really great 
Um, so if that's um, if that's something of interest to you, that could be part of your your well-being plan. Um, it's not just us that offers mental health first aid. There's lots of other mental health first aid trainers out there. Um, so that's something uh, to bear in mind that could go in um, your strategy. Um, for those of you who have done mental health first aid and you're thinking, oh, we've done it, it was all right, what's next? Like we need, we need like next level, what else could we do? Um, well, um, come out of all sorts of conversations. Oh, that's the video. Um, we'll have time for that. Um, so um, just off the back of the, the work that um, we've, we've been doing, um, um, is this area of kind of positive psychology. It's the study of what's right with people rather than what's wrong with people. You know, take the most, the healthiest, the most resilient, the happiest people, and you ask them, like, what's going on for you? How is it that you are in this place? And what can we do about it? Uh, that's a really interesting question when you start studying that, you know, for, from a, a scientific evidence-based uh, viewpoint. What's, what's come off the back of that? Some really interesting research just in the last kind of five, 10 years. And so, um, because this is something I've kind of been studying at university for the last um, a couple of years, something I've been interested in actually for a while, working in mental health. Um, um, so we've developed a number of uh, workshops. Um, PERMA, do you remember that was one of the kind of models and well-being measurement tools? Um, building resilience, coping skills, managing stress, communication skills. Sometimes that can be a real problem in some organisations. Um, psychological capital, I think I mentioned that. Um, so we've got a number of kind of workshops there which we kind of deliver into organisations and we just started doing that in the last month or so. What we're currently doing is we're delivering it online. Um, I'm happy um, to, for us to kind of have us and our trainers deliver this um, in-house, but obviously we think about COVID and risks and stuff like that. We need to kind of risk assess that. But it does work quite well um, even on Zoom, um, you know, so we do kind of videos and, and we do kind of like breakout rooms um, and um, we do that as a three hour workshop. So it's quite short and punchy little break in the middle. Um, and um, the other thing I would say about this is it's applied. What does that mean? So it's all well and good talking about the theory of oh, the theory of psychological capital. So what? Like, what does that mean for me day to day at work? What benefit can I actually get? So what's, what I suppose we want you to know is that these workshops are very um, actionable. You know, the idea is like, here's some ideas. And what you might find is that, I don't know, half the ideas don't resonate, but half of them might for different people, for different reasons. And that's great. If we can give people better tools, uh, models, ideas, ways of seeing things, ways of seeing themselves, um, that can really kind of help. Um, with improving the culture um, in, in a workplace and improving well-being. So this could be part of a, a well-being strategy. Um, okay, what are the benefits? I don't know if, know if, do I need to go through this, Amy? Probably not. I think you can probably imagine what the benefits are. Um, less presenteeism, less people leaving, more productivity. Like, I think you would know, like, you probably guess all this stuff. Um, but it's worth saying it, you know, this is why you would be doing it. Um, so just kind of final, really, just sort of just want to remind you, you know, like one of the things which is really interesting that increasingly new employees are interested in, they're interested in working with organisations that have an interest in, in social value, right? So um, what we're, as a, as a, as a, as a non-profit organisation, we do work with um, organisations. And yeah, sure, we might, you know, we don't like just doing like a like one workshop or one talk. We do like to kind of work with people and even advertise that. So there is something around, you know, that kind of link um, that you're kind of working with a well-being organisation that's non-profit that you're supporting them and they're supporting you. There's a nice kind of link there. So we're looking for relationships, really, um, if we kind of get involved with people. And that's also a good thing, uh, you know, if you end up communicating that internally and externally, you know, that this, this kind of work, um, that, that we do is actually driving improvements in the local community with the type of workshops I briefly mentioned at the top. We do lots of other things, not just in schools, um, um, but we, we do a lot of other uh, projects working with other kind of vulnerable people in the community. So um, I just want to kind of mention that we're not just like a all-profit business, but actually, you know, we've actually got some other kind of 
um, um, social interests going on. Okay, um, so if any of that's interest to you, uh, you know, I, feel free to email me. Obviously, you might have seen this on LinkedIn. Um, we've got emails on the chat um, function right at the start. We've got our website there too, EWP mindskent.co.uk so if you're interested in those workshops we've actually got some little videos and stuff explaining um unfortunately it's more video of me explaining what some of these kind of workshops are and and what the benefits are and we do have some material sort of explaining what's in these workshops if that's of interest um to to your place of work but um yeah if uh, feel free to to make contact if you fancy just a bit of a catch up over zoom um if you're interested if, if all you're interested in is some of those measures, like where do I get them from? If you can't find them, contact me. I'm quite happy to kind of send them out to you, um, you know, whether we do um, um, <coughs> any stuff together or not. Um, that's fine. I'm quite happy just to kind of send that out to you. That stuff you'll find out there on the internet anyway. Um, so we've got our, our email addresses here. Um, um, I've mentioned Colin earlier. If he did the scorecard thing, he might kind of uh, drop you a little email just to kind of check in with you. We have a regular newsletter. If you if you're registered via Eventbrite with an email address, you might see a newsletter coming some to you somewhere um, sometime soon. You can, if you're not interested, you can you can unsubscribe. That's quite easy to do. If you haven't registered through Eventbrite, then you can subscribe there. There's the link to subscribing um, on uh, to our newsletter. So um, thank you very much. Um, um, we've done that in reasonably good time. Um, let me um, just ask people um, any questions. I've kind of blasted over some stuff today. Um, anything that I've said, we've gone, hmm, not sure. What did he mean by that? Um, throw something in the chat function. Here's an interesting question. This is from my kind of coaching psychology. Um, maybe you can um, put this in a chat function. One thing that you're going to take away from today was there one idea that you thought, yes, I'm going to look into that. I'm going to do that. Um, throw something in the chat function, you know, because uh, I like to know, has what I said landed or has it just gone over everyone's head? Was there one thing that you thought, yeah, I'll, I'll give that a go. Um, so I'll just give you guys a minute. I'll hopefully some of you are typing. We'll just have an awkward silence for five, 10 seconds. Uh, so what's resonated with you today? Okay, uh, Laura Simpson, how do I register for the mental health first aid workshop, please? Yeah, so uh, uh, mental health first aid, um, we have, um, I think it probably kind of depends on um, your situation. If you're looking for like an individual spot, um, then I would look um, Mental Health First Aid England have loads. Um, we've, we're, we're running um, some in, yeah, there we go. Amy just put on um, some, we've got two day and a one day. Um, so they've got some links there onto our event right page. So Laura Simpson, that okay? Answer your question. Um, if I, if the dates that we're doing it in February don't suit, there are other providers that you might be able to get on and do training with. I don't know if they're any good. They're probably not as good as us. Would you say, Amy? I don't know. Probably not. Um, <laughs> but there will be some people out there. Um, there's plenty of other mental health first aid instructors. Um, next step for the mental health first aid workshop would be interesting as, as I've done this course. Yes. Yeah, so. This is the thing, I mean, because I've been I've been training mental health first aid for quite a few years. Um, and I always have conversations with people, they go, oh, that's great, but what's next? What's next? And so um, these positive psychology workshops that we offer to businesses um, is I sort of feel like the next step is sort of like that's great. With with you know, the mental health first aid is great for getting people feel more confident talking about mental well-being, knowing how to signpost people, how to um, how to support in the workplace. That's great. But what's next? What other ideas are out there? What else can I bring in to my organization that's going to have some benefit? Um, and I think people want little punchy workshops on managing stress, on preventing burnout, um, on building resilience. 
Um, it's really interesting, um, the, the research um, on resilience. Um, about 10, 15 years ago, um, the, the US Army actually approached um, Pennsylvania University where they do the positive psychology and said, look, can we have a, a resilience training plan for our staff sergeants? Um, and they developed a plan to trade 10,000 staff sergeants in mental resilience. Um, and they were then became train the trainers and they kind of trained people. So there's a real sort of application. This is not just like, oh, that's an interesting idea, but there's a real kind of application about, you know, um, how do you make people more resilient? How do you build resilience? Is it just, you know, is this something that people have or can you actually learn it? Is it a skill? Can you teach that? turns out you can teach it it's a teachable skill um and so there's, there's, a, there's a real sort of um need then i think in workplaces to have um even if it's just like you know just little bit little ideas that sort of try and increase um resilience um in in the workforce um what else we got um this is uh, indigit uh we will look and focus on fostering relationships at work and strategies thank you um yeah thank you for coming along indigit um yeah, I think that job embeddedness, that's a good one. You know, how do you kind of make people feel like they are uh, connected? Um, sometimes I call it the golden handcuffs. You know, like it's, it's sort of handcuffed to the organisation, but in a good way, it's golden. You know, you want the sort of feel uh, security and that it's not going to be easy to leave. You want, you, want, you want people, good people, to feel like it's easy to leave. You want them to feel like it would be a real sacrifice uh, to leave. Um, okay, any other questions? Or any other um, uh, uh, things that you've uh, found helpful today, um, feel free to throw on the chat. Um, if you have ideas or thoughts later on, and you've, you you want to you know have a quick catch up over Zoom or Microsoft Teams, and give us an email um, or drop us a, a, a line if you've got any questions. It's been lovely to have you all along today. I hope um, that it's been of some benefit uh, to you all. Um, have a good afternoon. Have a good weekend. Uh, make sure you look after yourselves as well. Important. You need to make sure you've got some fuel in the tank um, to look after other people. So, yeah, um, have a good afternoon, everyone. Take care. Thanks for, thanks for your time. Maybe we might speak uh, soon.